All right. Well, good evening, everybody. For anybody who's joining us for the first time tonight, my name is Zach Judd. I'm the director of education at Florida Oceanographic Society, and I am thrilled to welcome all of you to tonight's Coastal Lecture Series presentation. I'm also a little bit sad that it's our final talk of the season. I have no idea where the last 10 weeks have gone, but many of you have been here every single Tuesday night since early January, and I am so genuinely appreciative of your incredible attendance. As I've said many times before, we would not be able to run this lecture series without an awesome audience, and it's your turnout week after week after week that lets me bring in the incredible speakers that, that we're, we're able to secure. So without you, without a great turnout here at the library and at home on Zoom, this series wouldn't exist. So please pat yourselves on the back. This is all about you and for you, and I couldn't do it without you. Tonight's guest speaker, Dr. Edie Witter, is the CEO and senior scientist at ORCA, the Ocean Research and Conservation Association. Dr. Witter holds a bachelor's degree from Tufts University and a master's degree and PhD from the University of California, Santa Barbara. She's a MacArthur Fellow, a deep sea explorer, a conservationist, and a world-renowned authority on marine bioluminescence, things that glow in the deep, deep sea. She was part of the team that recorded the very first footage of a giant squid in its natural habitat. Dr. Witter has conducted hundreds of dives and submersibles and has served as chief scientist on dozens of ocean research expeditions. She's authored more than 100 scientific papers as well as a memoir, and her research has been featured on BBC, PBS, Discovery Channel, and National Geographic television programs. One of her TED Talks has 1.6 million views on YouTube, and another has been viewed nearly 5.2 million times. I would encourage all of you to search for those TED Talks when you have some time. I think you'll really enjoy them. Dr. Witter is also a tireless advocate for the Indian River Lagoon. In 2005, to help protect the ocean that she loves, she helped found the Ocean Research and Conservation Association. Tonight, She'll be telling us more about the work that Orca is doing to help reverse the declining health of our beloved Indian River Lagoon. This is our final presentation of the year, guys, and I am so excited to end it with an incredible presentation from Dr. Edie Witter. Thank you, Zach. So I was actually supposed to give this talk back in January, and I got COVID and had to cancel. And so uh, a week ago when I started having a cough, I thought, no, <laughs> this, this, this can't happen again. So I have echinacea, I have Hall's menthol. <laughs> so I'm, I'm gonna get through this, but I'm a little worried I might run out of voice before the end and be reduced to shadow puppets, so bear with me. Um, first of all, thank you all for coming uh, on it's such a beautiful day. By the way, do we have any math nerds in the audience, math nerds that are aware that today is Pi Day? March, ah, there we go, look at that, all right, way to go. Both my parents were mathematicians, so it's a special day. <laughs> anyway, um, so I'm gonna talk to you about some of the um, findings that we've been getting from the Indian River Lagoon and uh, share with you some of my thoughts uh, that have kind of evolved over the years about what we need to be doing to try to clean up this mess. And it really is a mess. So it wasn't that long ago when we were referring to the Indian Lagoon as the most biologically diverse estuary in the United States. It was amazing. When my husband and I moved here in 1989, this was back in the day when we went out to the mailbox to pick up our, our newspaper every day. Um, th there were roseate spoonbills that would fly over every morning. And I don't see those anymore. Manatees come up to our dock. Bird life was just amazing. Now we're getting known for our fish kills, our toxic algae blooms, and tragically, uh, mass mortality of manatees in this past year. This is not what we want to be known for, but unfortunately it's starting to happen. And we've had more than our share of algae blooms, it seems like. Fairly colorful ones, red tide, brown tide, blue-green algae. Red tide usually happens more on the west coast. Um, and we occasionally get it on the east coast, usually when it gets caught in a loop current and carried around to this side. In um, October 2018, I took this picture on North Hutchinson Island 
uh, which was just from the red tide coming around from, from the west coast. Brown tide is a fascinating harmful algal bloom. It's not toxic and it's a weird little bugger because it actually survives very well on low nutrients and low light levels. So it seems like what happens is some other kind of disruption has to occur first and then the brown tide comes in and takes over. And this has happened up and down the coast of uh, Texas. They've had a brown tide there for two decades. And there was a brown tide along the eastern seaboard that um, wiped out this uh, scallop fishery up there. Uh, so this brown tide came in, um, we had a kind of a micro algae bloom of uh, green alga in 2011 and then the brown, brown tide came in and it led to some pretty unpleasant consequences. Blocked out the sunlight. Um, it, uh, when the bloom died, the micro, uh, microbial community consumed the di dying algae and all the oxygen, and so we had a massive, massive fish kill, really very hard on what had been a prime fishing spot in the northern part of the Indian River Lagoon. And then it, uh, that brown tide is being blamed for what's been happening with the manatees because it just killed off so much of the seagrass that could no longer had enough sunlight in order to survive. We've also had blue-green algae blooms, which I'm afraid people down here are all too familiar with. This was the one in 2016, which that's not photoshopped in any way, as you know. That's exactly what it looked like. Uh, and so microcystis is a particularly disturbing uh, harmful algal bloom because of the toxin involved, which is called microcystin. It's, um, it attacks the liver, so it's called a hepatotoxin. And uh, there's a lot of literature on this, a lot of it coming out of China, um, because a lot of the water supply has been um, impacted by microcystin. It, it's, uh, it's a small, tough little mo molecule, um, very toxic, and doesn't denature if you boil it. So um, you know that it's going mainstream when a mainstream advertising campaign for drinking water uh, filtration systems starts mentoring microcystin right up front. It's becoming more and more of a problem worldwide and partly because it is just so toxic at such very low levels, such low levels that the World Health Organization sets the limit in drinking water at one part per billion. That would be the equivalent of one drop in a tanker truck full of water. And they set the limit in recreational exposure at 10 parts per billion. Now, we have evidence, perhaps, that we're already having issues because of microcystis and microcystin. So back in 2015, Ohio State University did a study where they took two national data sets. They took toxic algae blooms in one case, and then they took non-alcohol related liver disease in the other, and they overlaid the two data sets, and any place they found a correlation, they put a red spot. Now it's important when you're looking at this to recognize that correlation does not mean causation, but it's something to be interested in at the very least. And so there is one red spot right here in Florida, and it's right here surrounding Lake Okeechobee and the Indian River Lagoon. So uh, how is microcystin getting into human beings? Well. It can get in through the drinking water. Um, we know this from a number of different instances. Lake Erie in 2014 had a microcystis bloom big enough that it could be seen by satellite. And this is what the inlet to the Toledo water plant looked like. And so they had to issue a do not use order. Not just do not drink, but do not use, do not touch for a half a million customers that they then had to get bottled water for because of um, this toxic algae. It can also uh, get into us through aerosolization and any of you that were here in 2016 and went down to Central Marine know about this or anywhere where this bloom was occurring. The smell was overwhelming. 
I described it as being kind of a cross between vomit and poopy diapers. <laughs> it was gross. And I went down here to take a sample. I think I had maybe a 15 minute exposure to get a sample and I was sick for a full 24 hours afterwards with a headache and nausea. So there's acute responses as well as chronic impacts on the liver. So Martin Memorial Hospital had a noticeable uptick in admissions as did a lot of the emergency rooms because of this aerosolized toxin. Another way it gets into us is through bioaccumulation. It goes up the food chain. So you've got this little microalga that gets eaten by plankton, that get eaten by small fish, that get eaten by larger fish, that get eaten by even larger fish. And so it concentrates it. So it can be particularly impactful because it's so concentrated. And we got very interested in this because of what happened at Blue Cypress Lake. Um, <clears throat> this was in... Uh, I've lost the date. I think it was 2018. It was 2018. So this is a pristine little lake um, in Indian River County. It's the headwaters of the St. John's River. It's near Felsmere, just east of Yeehaw Junction. Um, one of the densest populations of nesting ospreys anywhere. It's absolutely beautiful. Um, but since 2013, they have been spreading uh, trucking um, biosolids from wastewater treatment plants down in Broward County and Miami-Dade up to spread around Blue Cypress Lake with the idea of fertilizing the grass, which are then fed on by cattle, um, which is it's not a completely unreasonable thing to do. I mean, we are... are, are Systems are based on cycles. You don't just get rid of something. You have to put it back into the system. But what they were doing to calculate how much biosolids they should be spreading was they were calculating the amount of nitrogen that was needed, and they ignored the phosphate. And so the phosphate levels in Blue Cypress Lake were just going up and up and up. So this was completely legal, but it's not smart. And as a result, in June 2018, I got word, actually, from my hairdresser, who was t telling me, she lived out on Blue Cypress Lake, and she said, you know, they were having this algae bloom, and I, you know, we went out, Orca went out to check it, and it was considerable amount of blue-green algae, it was microcystis, and remember I said that the World Health Organization sets the limit in drinking water at one part per billion? and the recreational exposure at 10 parts per billion, that jar right there had 4,700 parts per billion of microcystin in it. So we, we did some more studies, and I'm not gonna go through all of this, um, but the point was that we found Splenda and Tylenol. Obviously, the cattle were not taking sugar uh, substitutes and, and Tylenol. This was human waste. And we were able to track it through that. Um, and <clears throat> we collected a couple of bluegill fish the first time we were out there and measured the amount of microcystin in their fillets and their liver. And the first, those first measurements were pretty alar alarming because a single serving, even at the lowest concentration, um, produced an unacceptable dose of microcystin to a human being that would have consumed it. However, then we went back at the end of the month, which was just a couple weeks later, and collected more fish. And all of the fish, except for one tilapia that you see that red line there, um, were within an acceptable limit of microcystin in their fillets. But this got us interested in you know, tracking more of the toxins that are getting into our food web. Who's eating them? How much exposure are they getting? How do we figure that out? And so ORCA has started a, a very significant citizen science program. If you're not familiar with citizen science, it's about in educating and engaging community members in solving the problems that are leading to the degradation of the Indian River Lagoon. And one of our citizen science program is our One, Fi one Health Fish Monitoring, where we collect data on the accumulation of toxins and toxicants in fish living in the Indian River Lagoon and then try to figure out what the exposure is to individuals. 
So um, we test, we have um, 250 city, citizen scientists that have contributed over 1,600 lab hours in 2022, 79 collectors, 150 processors, um, 22 to, that are trained in further analysis. This is a very successful program. We have almost 100% retention rate of our citizen scientists. Um, and they have to go through considerable training to be able to do this, but they're a very dedicated group of people. And so we're testing these fish that we've been collecting for microcystin, um, another uh, toxic algae bloom toxin, saxitoxin, herbicides like glyphosate, heavy metals, mercury and cadmium, pharmaceuticals like PFAS, uh, which is the forever chemicals you may have been hearing about in the news, and then we're also measuring microplastics. Um, this is a program that we need help with uh, down in um, Stewart, especially if any of you are fishers that would like to donate your fish or would like to help us process these fish. Um, there's literature on the back table. And Lauren Tracy, who is here, where, where are you, Lauren? In the back, um, can give you more information about our citizen science program. Um, another way that microsystems may be getting into our uh, food web is through agriculture, through our food because we are watering our crops with water that turns out to be laden with microcystins. And we found this out because we put our um, water quality monitors that we call Kilroy's in the canal systems uh, out in the ag region and discovered what we call these cryptic algae blooms. That they were cryptic in the sense that we didn't see the blue-green neon color that you see with a really dense aggregation, but we saw uh, an increase on our sensors. And so that microcystin is there, and we wanted to see, okay, at what level do we find we can measure it taken up in the crops? So we just did a simple quick and dirty experiment in the lab where we put um, uh, 10 parts per billion in the water versus a control, which was just water. And this, these are lettuce seedlings. And as you can see, it, the microcystin is greatly reducing the crop yield. So what, is, what happens when a farmer sees his crop yield go down? He adds more fertilizer, which feeds the toxic algae blooms. Now, whether these are concentrations that are significant enough to impact human health is not clear. A lot of these things have not been heavily studied. Um, microcystin, as I said, is actually one of the ones that has been the most studied. There are others to be concerned about that have been less well studied. One of these is beta-methylaminoalanine, known as BMAA, which is a neurotoxin that is produced by a lot of toxic algae blooms. And it has been linked to Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and Lou Gehrig's disease. And the evidence on this is not as strong as with microcystin, partly because BMAA is so difficult to measure accurately. Um, so it's left a lot of people arguing about whether or not uh, something was proven or not. Um, but uh, back in 2020, Dr. Walter Bradley, who was the former chairman of the University of Miami's Department of Neurology, co-authored an op-ed about his concerns about this particular um, issue with BMAA. And his he said that this failure to act on evidence presented by mounting scientific research is placing the long-term health of Floridians at risk. So he believes it's a, con it's a considerable concern. Um, and there is growing data that shows, for example, if you feed BMA to animals, they produce neurological changes like Alzheimer's and ALS. If you want to know more about BMAA, because that's another whole lecture all in and of itself, there's a, a very good documentary called Toxic Puzzle, um, which uh, talks about the scientist Paul Cox um, that first proposed this theory that BMAA is having this impact because our bodies mistake it for an amino acid that we use normally to synthesize our proteins, L-serine, and then the BMA gets take, taken up when it's present instead of L-serine, and when it does, the proteins misfold and form those plaques that are associated with those neurodegenerative diseases. 
I think, I believe that this video is still streaming on Prime Video. I'm pretty sure you can watch it online. Um, so pollutants are originating from many potential sources. And so when I started ORCA um, in 2005, we wanted to figure out where the pollution was coming from. And our tagline is mapping pollution and finding solutions. And we have a number of different approaches to that challenge, including uh, remote sensing with satellite. Um, we're working on algorithms with uh, colleagues out in Ohio. Um, we have our water quality monitors called the Kilroys. Um, <clears throat> and then we have pollution mapping and toxin tracking in our citizen science program. So the Kilroys um, are real-time monitors. Uh, we currently have, um, I think we've got 20, oh no, we've got 19 out right now, and we're about to get three more out. Um, so we'll have 22. So we're in, they're in most of the major um, inlets into the Indian River Lagoon. That's one of their advantages is that they're small enough to go on existing dock, dock pilings and channel markers. Um, and uh, you can see what a challenge this is to keep these operational. That's what the sensor system below the water line looks like when you put it in. And this is what it looks like 72 days later. That's what's known as biofouling. Um, but we do a lot of cross-checking. We go out monthly, um, send samples to NELAP certified labs for third-party verification, um, and do everything we possibly can to um, make this data set readily available. It's um, free to anyone online if you go to our website, teamorca.org. Uh, so these are where the current um, Kilroys are located. And I said we're about to add three more. Um, and it allows us to look at things like the annual input of average phosphate coming into these different waterways. And you can see how much different it is in the northern part of the Indian River Lagoon than the central and southern part of the lagoon. And this is 2019, 2020, 2021, and 2022. So you can see in general, actually, in 2022, things were a little bit better in the central and southern part of the lagoon than they had been previously. Uh, there was an increase in phosphate at Cars Park in the northern part of the lagoon, as well as at Grand South and Grand North. So this gives us a way to figure out where the pollution is coming from um, and hopefully f track it back to its source. We can also do real-time monitoring, um, which is a very powerful tool. So for example, this is in the North Fork um, of the St. Lucie River just before Hurricane Irma. Um, <clears throat> and that first pulse that you see is when they open the gates, um, the floodgates, because they, they know that the rain is coming, and so they're going to empty the, the waters. And so we get this huge pulse of phosphate that comes in prior to the hurricane. And then the hurricane hits, and we get another big pulse of phosphate. And so that's the true advantage of real-time monitoring, is being able to see that. So when... Um, we started doing the Kilroys in particular, I frequently got asked by people, so what's the smoking gun? What, what is the biggest problem for the Indian River Lagoon? And I used to spend a lot of time explaining, well, every part of the Indian River Lagoon has a different problem, as you could see from that phosphate input. It's different in different parts of the lagoon. It's actually coming from different sources. And, um, but I started over time to realize, well, actually, there is one smoking gun. And that is all of the stormwater runoff. Now, that's not a novel concept. I mean, stormwater runoff is something that every place in the country has to deal with. But it's kind of unique to Florida because of everything that was done to Florida in its early days in order to make the state habitable. So, for example, one of the things that was done was in the, uh, um, between two, 1962 and 1971, they straightened out the Kissimmee River, which you see in the top left-hand panel, into one long, straight, deep channel. So it went from a 103-mile-long meandering river that used to flood its banks and supported just amazing, amazing animal life um, to this 56-mile-long deep canal that before they were even finished, they knew they'd made a mistake, a huge mistake, because Lake Okeechobee was suddenly polluted and the animal life was gone. The original cost of doing that straightening of the Kissimmee was $194 million, 
We're already past five times that to try to fix it. If you want to see the, the pattern throughout Florida, I have this very amazing set of aerial photographs. So that channel you see there is a tributary feeding into the North Fork of the um, St. Lucie River. And that is what eventually was turned into the C-24 Canal. So you see how spongy the land was. And everything was about getting the water off the land as fast as we possibly could. We needed to get the water off in order to make it habitable, in order to make it useful for agriculture, in order to deal with malaria. And so this is the next stage, 1960. They're starting to dredge the North Fork. Those are spoil islands that you see, the, those white spots there. They've put in um, the Florida Turnpike. And 1970, they put in the entire road system for Port St. Lucie. That's quite a change to the environment in a very short period of time. And by 2012, and now very, looks very much the same as this, this is what we're dealing with. And so what we've done is we've taken this spongy surface and turned it into a gray funnel. And so when water hits the land, instead of percolating down and being filtered and cleaned in the manner in which nature intended, it just rushes off the land as quickly as possible and carries as many pollutants as possible. So the simple trick that we need to be using on the Indian River Lagoon is to slow the flow. And it turns out that so many of the things that we can be doing for the lagoon that would make a difference is just about reversing all of this stuff that the Army Corps of Engineers did in the early days to speed up getting the water off the land. We need to go back to what it was to slow the flow. And that's not an original idea. I stole that from some other um, uh, conservation organizations that use it. But I think Florida needs it more than any other state in the union, given what we've done to our waterways. So our typical landscaping is the kind of thing you see here in the top right-hand corner. That's the moorings where everybody's got a deep water dock. So they carved out these canals into the mangroves and then built homes. And those homes, like you see in the bottom right, are um, on elevated land that has sloping grass lawns right down to the edge of the um, seawall. And when we started doing pollution maps where we go out and we take a sediment sample and measure what's in the sediment, the muck that's on the bottom of the, the lagoon, we found these striking differences like you see here. So this is nitrogen in the muck. And in the um, moorings itself, it's incredibly high. We're just feeding the potential toxic algae blooms. And so the thing is that this is well known in other parts of the country. And there are places like Virginia where slope lawns on the waterfront are being replaced by mulched beds and deep-rooted native plants. And, and right now, we have more of this kind of thing still going on in Florida, where every time you mow the lawn, the only thing that can happen is the grass clippings go into the water. And every time you fertilize the lawn, the fertilizer goes into the water. And the herbicide treatment, the herbicides go into the water. The grass clippings are particularly bad, way worse than I ever first imagined. But you talk to any organic farmer who's ever used grass clippings as fertilizer, it's really easy. They use something they call a bioreactor, but you can just use a bucket, put water in it, throw in grass clippings, put in a little air bubbler from the aquarium store, and in a couple of days, you've got fertilizer. It's perfect. But we're doing that all the time on these sloping grass lawns. And so we really need to rethink this and start re-landscaping. So this is the southern part of the moorings where they've taken on that challenge, where they've changed it from what you see on the left, which are these grass strips right along the waterfront, to bedded plants um, that reduce the runoff. And it can be beautiful. And we need to start changing our mindset about what is an appropriate landscape along the Indian River Lagoon, because a, a little of this goes a long way to making a big difference. For example, in the um, Chesapeake Bay, the northern 
part of the Chesapeake Bay, the Susquehanna River that feeds into it, has a forest buffer between the river and the agricultural land, and it makes a huge difference. So we wanted to do a demonstration project to show what a difference this could make. And um, we worked with uh, the city of Stewart and did a demonstration park at, pro project at Shepherd's Park where we looked at the drainage, which you see the yellow lines are the drains that are embedded in the grass. And so when it rains, that water just floods right out of a pipe into the Indian River Lagoon. Or you have what the blue lines show, which is just direct runoff from the, the um, seawall into the Indian River Lagoon. And so we measured what was coming out of those drains, um, nitrate, ammonia, and phosphate, um, before we did the landscaping. Um, this is actually the runoff um, before we did the landscaping. And then we got with a landscape architect and we put in um, bedded plants and swales to slow the flow. The whole point was to slow the flow and minimize the amount of runoff. We also um, put in signage so that we could educate the public about what a difference this could be making uh, for the Indian River Lagoon. And then we've been testing there since then and found a very significant decrease in the phosphate levels from before we did the landscaping, which is the blue, till after, which is the red. And that's just from the drainage pipes and there's no more runoff. We just eliminated the runoff completely. Even better for than um, buffered shorelines is swales. Swales can make a very big difference in slowing the water down. Uh, and so this is my house um, before on the left, typical grass lawn right up to the edge of the seawall. And so we wanted to do the best thing we possibly could to be model citizens for the Indian River Lagoon. And, uh, but we also had a dog who liked grass. And so we, we compromised, we got rid of most of the grass. So you see, you see a swale there um, that has uh, perennial peanut and sunshine mimosa and muley grass. Um, and, um, but around the side, uh, for Yankee's sake, um, we, decided, we decided we had to have a little patch of grass because there's just no greater amount of happiness <laughs> than being able to roll on a patch of grass. Um, so in order to be able to keep the grass, what we did was we put in a French drain all the way around the edges of the property and then a storage tank, which you see in blue there. And so all of the rainwater that we coll collected in the French drains um, are pumped into the storage tank and then we would use that to irrigate the lawn. So um, initially, I was extremely happy with this. We were boasting about it, sharing it with the public. This is you know, what it looked like. Uh, that uh, frontage on the uh, seawall is also an experiment um, that we're doing with somebody in Kansas. Um, it's called a reef wall, and it's got um, mangrove-type roots with oyster shell ground up in the cement, and actually it recruits oysters very well. Um, <clears throat> so. Uh, it, was, it was looking pretty good, and it was attracting um, bees. The bees loved the sunshine mimosa. It was, it was all great for a while. But there were some problems. So the first problem was that we couldn't get the yard crews to maintain it, because the only way they know how to maintain is with glyphosate. And we kept saying, no glyphosate, no Roundup. And, um, but they wouldn't hand weed, and so the weeds got ahead of us. And we were also trying to you know, do something that anybody could do, not somebody that's just so crazy dedicated that they're gonna be out there weeding all the time. Um, and uh, then the other thing that happened was, it, this worked great during the rainy season, but during the dry season, there wasn't enough rain in our catch tank to water the lawn, and so we'd have to go out and we'd put a hose into the tank to fill it. It's like that scene from um, uh, Baby Boom. Oh good, I can just refill the dry well from the hose. <laughs> but we were, we were you know, using the hose to refill the, the tank, 
and it would take two hours. And it would make me insane. So I have to confess here that I'm a little bit fanatic about overuse of water. And this dates back to my early days as a deep sea biologist, because when I first started going to sea, I was often not only the only woman on the ship, but often the first woman on a ship. And in those days, we didn't manufacture our water at sea. We had to take all our potable water in tanks. And if we ran out of water, the expedition was over. Well, if they ran out of water, they'd always blame the woman, because she'd obviously be taking Hollywood showers. And I got very proud of the fact that I, you know, I think the average person, uh, I forget what the, the number is, I wrote it down here someplace, takes um, 20 gallons for a shower, about. I've, there's different numbers. I figure I've, I can do it in three gallons. I take a classic Navy shower, and I was so proud of this because on a ship, everybody can hear how much water you're using. And so I, I never wanted to be blamed. I got my comeuppance on this when I went out on an expedition for the first time with the Brits off north, the northwest coast of Africa, very big ship. Um, I wasn't the first woman they'd had on board, but they told me because I was going to be a woman on board, they had put on an extra 10,000 gallons of water <laughs> for this one month expedition. And of course I went ballistic, but they had the data to back it up because they'd had a woman on board before. And it turns out when there's a woman on board, the men take more showers. <laughs> so you can't win. But I, to this day, I have trouble with water running. It just makes me crazy. And it's not just that history, but it's also as a biologist, I know what it means that we're running out of water. We're going to have water wars. And, you know, it's truly, truly alarming how much we're sucking water out of our aquifers. These aquifers hold water like a sponge. And the Floridan aquifer is one of the most productive in the whole world. I mean, it was this gift of just amazingly clean, cheap, and plentiful water. Where do you ever have that? And we've been sucking it dry to, to water our lawns. And I, I just didn't want to be part of that. Um, and also, we've got drinking water level supplies that are diminishing. So 50% uh, of our withdrawal is um, for ag irrigation. And, and then you know, a tremendous amount of it is for drinking water. And we're already running low on that. Plus, sucking water out of the aquifer leads to other kinds of problems. This is not something you want to wake up to. So I've talked to secondary insurance industry, or tried to talk to the secondary insurance industry without much success about the fact that they should be incentivizing people when the, everybody has to replace their, buffer, their bulkheads at some point, if they could incentivize them to replace them with living shorelines, it would be a win-win situation because it would help the environment, it would reduce the uh, amount of storm damage, uh, it, it would be a a great way to slow the flow and help improve the health of the Indian River Lagoon. Um, so all of these things are kind of individual things that we can be doing along the shoreline of the Indian River Lagoon. Um, buffering is, it could make a big difference, but we still have pretty major problems with the amount of muck that's built up in the bottom of the lagoon. And how are we ever going to deal with that? Um, so right now, Brevard has instituted a half-cent tax, and they're using it to remove a lot of that muck, dredging it out. Um, it'll be very interesting to see how much of an impact that does have, because muck flux is a major portion of the nutrient flux into the um, Indian River Lagoon. Uh, but there's another interesting idea that I haven't heard talked about enough, I think, and this is this concept of ex kind of what are called external kidneys. I don't know if you know about this Osprey Acres Stormwater Park in Vero Beach. Um, it's open to the public. I recommend going to it. It's, it's absolutely beautiful. Um, but it, it's an interesting comp concept. Uh, I've talked to Alan Stewart, who was the engineer that was involved in developing some of these external kidneys. And the concept is that you've got on the left-hand side of the screen um, 
an algal turf scrubber that grows algae as a way to extract nutrients from the canal water that's being fed into it uh, at millions of gallons per day. Uh, then there's a second set of um, raceways that uh, have um, water hyacinth that can um, also grow on the nutrients. And they harvest the algae and they harvest the water hyacinth, thereby pulling nutrients out of the system. And then it goes through this meandering, um, something that's sort of like a stormwater treatment area. Um, so this is what the uh, managed aquatic plant system looks like with the algae. So the turf scrubber is just a big slab of concrete, and you've got these um, uh, tractors with rubber blades on the um, shovels, and they can harvest half that area in about two and a half hours. They do half at a time. And th then you see the algae in the bottom left-hand corner there, which then can be incorporated into compost. Um, so it's it could be actually beneficial um, if handled properly. Uh, and the costs make a lot of sense in some ways. I mean, yes, you need land to do it with, no question. But it costs $100 per pound to remove phosphate this way versus $400 to $500 per pound from a stormwater treatment area. Uh, and you could also use this methodology to satisfy carbon capture um, abilities. So that you can, we're going to be selling carbon capture at some point. And this capability of this managed aquatic plant system has 20 times the carbon capture of uh, the Amazon rainforest and 100 times the carbon capture capability of crop lands. Also, it is a second, the second stage, which is the uh, wetland part of it, provides, tree, um, provides fish and wildlife habitat to a, a pretty impressive degree. Uh, when I was walking around, I was really impressed by the number of birds I saw there. And they come and they feed on the algae turf scrubber. There's a lot of little plankton feeding on the algae. Uh, and it's, it's, I think, a very positive thing that is being done in Indian River County. They have, I think, three of the three or maybe four of these systems now. They have Osprey Marsh. They have um, the uh, Egret Marsh, and uh, I forget what the latest one was uh, called. Um, but this matters because. This is providing us a way to improve our health and our economy into the future, but also to help sustain our life support systems. Because yes, we're talking about how we're gonna survive here with more people coming in, more water being drained from the aquifer, more pollutants being put into the Indian River Lagoon. But we also have to look at the bigger picture of our planetary life support systems and recognize what a huge impact estuaries have on the ocean as a whole. I mean, the fact that this was called the most biologically diverse estuary in the United States is a big deal because estuaries may be only about 0.3% of the world ocean, but they represent more than 80% of the fish and shellfish species um, that have to use that for usually for spawning. Um, and of all of the most biodiverse habitats on the planet, coral reefs, rainforests, and estuaries top the, the heap. And most of our world population lives near estuaries and are impacting them this way that we're seeing in the Indian River Lagoon. And so one of the things we really try to emphasize at, at ORCA is that we don't want to be finger pointers. What we have to understand is that we're all polluters. We're just trying to find solutions that work and that make sense and use science to drive change. And with that, I'll close and take any questions you might have. Thank you. I'm so glad my voice held out. Yeah. Yes. So
so we've been, I made presentations to the Vero Beach City Council, um, and they now have uh, a, um, a plan, it's not adopted yet, that all future developments um, along the waterfront will have to have a 10-foot buffer. Can you, could you repeat the question? Oh, I'm sorry. The question was what, whether we work with the county um, to try to implement some of the things that we've been finding. Yeah. That's a, so the question is, how long does it take microcystin to degrade in the environment? And um, that's a very good question. It's something that uh, we've actually tried to look at. Microcystin doesn't denature. So it's around for quite some time. But yet, when we saw that big bloom up at Blue Cypress Lake, um, we saw a decrease in the amount of microcystin in the fish very quickly. So. Uh, you know, is that because the fish that were most impacted died? We didn't see a fish die off, so I don't think so. Um, it could be that it just goes through their systems pretty fast. And so those are the kinds of things we're trying to get more answers to. Yeah. Oh, why was there a higher accumulation of microcystin in the female fish? I wouldn't put too much stock in that, given that that was just one fish. Those were, those were, was literally an N of two, because we just happened to collect these two fish and measure them and then be surprised how much microcystin was in them. And so then we went back to collect more fish, and they weren't near, it wasn't nearly as much microcystin in them. Yes? BMAA? Oh, why is BMAA so hard to measure? Um, some chemicals are just very difficult. I don't actually know. I'm not enough of a chemist to understand what it is. But we've tried to find people that we could work with that would measure BMAA for us um, and found that very difficult. And it, it, uh, there's a lot of contentiousness. There was a study done in the Indian River Lagoon, and they found BMAA in the brains of dolphins in the Indian River Lagoon. And um, there was some suggestions that when dolphins behave oddly, like going up um, freshwater inlets um, and s seem to be almost self-destructive, that they may be impact being impacted by BMAA. I, I don't know if that's true. And actually, if you guys are interested, Adam Schaefer from Harbor Branch, who's an epidemiologist, gave a presentation about that a few years ago. So on our Coastal Lecture Series website, there's a recording of that presentation that uh, will give you some more information about that exact question. Yes. With all the information that's coming out of the biological study, how comfortable would you be eating the fish on the I would I wouldn't eat the fish, but um, <laughs> that doesn't mean that I, I want to be careful how I you asked me how comfortable I would be eating the fish. Um, I have a choice. So I wouldn't eat it. But there are people that are eating those fish that that's their primary source of protein. And so it's not a choice for them. And so that's why we're trying to figure out just how much of a dose are they actually getting, and it, is it really dangerous? Well, back in the day, I mean, fishing, and I showed you, was a huge draw, and probably still is. Um, and it was a huge draw. Yeah, she said that back in the day that fishing in Lake Okeechobee was a huge draw, and it, actually it still very much is. So when we surveyed some of those fishers, some of them are coming up from Fort Lauderdale, and they've been doing it for generations. It's just part of their family um, history to, to come up and fish Lake Okeechobee. So I'm going to jump in. We've got some great questions coming in from our Zoom audience. And uh, so the first one was about your swale that you built in your backyard. You mentioned having a tough time with the dry season. Are there any native plants that are more adapted to our seasonal fluctuations and precipitation that would work in that same setting? Yeah, and I've worked with a landscape architect, Meg Whitmer, who knows the, the plants, and she's selected plants for us, which I'm not even going to try to re remember what they are now, um, to, uh, that are more uh, drought tolerant than what we had before. Yeah.
Well, you're obviously a better gardener than I am. <laughs> I'm trying to find something that brown thumbs can live with. Good for you. Yes. The phosphates do remain in the compost, and once again, but you know, we can't, it's, it's part of a cycle. So the question is, you know, how do you use that compost? Where do you use it? Um, but yes, we, ha we have to have a much better understanding of our nutrient cycles because, you know, we're, we're pulling nitrogen out of the air um, and putting so much of into, into our waterways that, and then pulling phosphate out of the ground and we're gonna run out of phosphate, so we need to start recycling the phosphate that we're pulling out of the ground. So we have to figure out the best ways. There's advanced wastewater treatment capabilities, too, that can help with this. And I would encourage any um, funding that we can get towards advanced wastewater treatment, because those are some of the success stories in environmental um, situations is, is where they've instituted advanced wastewater treatment. They've started to see major improvements because even though you think you're getting rid of your, your problem, we then use reuse water to irrigate our properties. And a lot of that reuse water has a lot of nutrients in it, more than we need. And in many cases, people don't even realize that they're irrigating with nutrients from in their reuse water because then they're having green lawn or whatever the companies are that come Chemex or to come in and put more nutrients on, which is not needed and in fact detrimental. So we have a, another good question from our Zoom audience about phosphorus levels in the Indian River Lagoon and how they're different from north to south. This guest was wondering whether water in the Indian River Lagoon flows from north to south and whether the higher levels that you're observing are purely due to local stormwater runoff or whether there's some cumulative effect from phosphorus running from north to south. The, pre the presumption for the high phosphorus in the central and southern part of the lagoon is, for, is that it's primarily from agriculture. All right, I've got some more Zoom questions. Uh, What's the concentration of microcystin in the sludge at the bottom of the IRL, the muck, the, the, the bottom deposits? Well, actually, we just did the most comprehensive study we've ever done, um, and we're going to be looking at that. I don't have the answer to that right now. A lot of what we do depends on getting the funding, in, but we just got a nice piece of funding, to. So we're, we're actually um, doing a pollution map of Queens Cove that it's going to have more layers than any other map we've ever done. And it's going to include microcystin and glyphosate and some of the other things we've been talking about. Here's a great question about your Kilroy data. Are the Kilroy data available online and shared with other environmental groups that are working to save the Indian River? Yes, it's completely free. If you go to teamorca.org, um, there's a live feed button in the top right-hand corner um, that uh, you can go to any one of our Kilroys at any time. Um, and it's got a, a pretty nice plotting program, so you can look back at it over time as well. Yeah, you had a question? Well, that's why I'm kind of interested in these external kidneys that I was talking about as a possible way to do that. Because I've, I've been looking at different ideas over time, and this seems like the, it's got the most supporting data. There, there's a lot of snake oil salesmen out there that have a lot of ideas that I would be very cautious about. Um, but this one does make a, a certain amount of sense, and they have, they've got some really good supporting data for it. So that would be one way to help clean up the Indian River Lagoon. I don't know how many of those kidneys it would take, but it could be done. So we have a Zoom question kind of related to that. One of our viewers is wondering, what happens to all the organic material that's harvested from the treatment facilities up in Vero Beach? So Alan Stewart, who uh, is the engineer I spoke of that has had so much to do with this, has been trying to get 
innovators involved in trying to figure out how to use the, the algae that they're um, uh, harvesting, not, not only the algae, but the water hyacinth. And I mean, there's a, there've been a lot of good ideas for these kinds of things, but uh, they've just never been pursued. And par partly because there just hasn't been the funding for it. But the thing is that there's this synergism that could result if you could get this um, to pay for itself, it would make such a big step towards implementing it. And right now, it's still a little too costly in most people's eyes, even though we're already starting to pay for removal of phosphate. Um, but uh, this could be a way to do it and actually create a product. So we have a, another Zoom question about, about politics. The viewer is wondering whether Orca weighs in on, on political, political decisions and legislation, specific legislation that's aimed at uh, reducing nutrient input into, into waterways. I think, I think we've done a pretty good job of walking that line um, because we're, we're, as I said, it's really important to us not to be finger pointers. I just think that that's so counterproductive. And so we just try to prevent, present information to the policymakers. I, you know, I give presentations in Tallahassee and other places um, where we try to share our information as many ways as possible. Um, and uh, so we we interact with our local governments probably more than our state government, but but we do both. Yeah. Yeah, so the question was, if they dredge the C-44 canal, does it take a lot of the muck out? Yeah, I mean, they're taking a huge amount of muck out of um, up in Brevard County with dredging. And one of my concerns with the dredging was that um, John Treffrey at FIT had been involved with a dredging project up there. And when they dredged, he went back and tested, and he was still getting pretty high levels of muck flux, of nutrient flux from the muck. And the thing was that the, they had come in like they normally do when they um, dredge, which is they're just trying to do it for boat traffic. So they just did a channel down the center, and they left it up the sides, and it just slumped back down. And, and so I talked to the engineers that are doing it up in Brevard, and they're aware of that. And so they have a different dredging method that is supposedly pulling it off the sides as well. So that's why I'm very interested to see how much of a difference it actually makes up there. Because that, that's a pretty innovative thing that they're trying to do. And that muck is a huge, huge problem. It's probably our biggest problem. Yes? So the idea behind the stormwater treatment areas is exactly what I was advocating, which is slow the flow. What's that? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, how are the stormwater treatment areas being used? That was the question, right? Um, and it's exactly the concept I was promoting, which is slow the flow and let nature do its thing. And that's all very well and good, but the thing is that one of the contentious things about stormwater treatment areas is, is they age out, you know, they fill up with muck, they, they fill up with organic matter, and, and they get nutrient overloaded. Um, and so that's where this um, uh, aquatic plant approach, managed aquatic plants, may be a better way to proceed because you can um, get a lot more bang for your buck from your stormwater treatment area if you first pull the nutrients out with this, these managed aquatic plant systems. Yeah. How do we encourage uh, property owners to build these buffers around their property? Oh, I'm so, so the question was, how do we encourage property owners to um, build these buffers? I'm so glad you asked that because actually uh, we are trying to do that. We actually got funding um, and we've been looking for people that are property owners down here in Stewart because we got funding from Impact 100 to do some demonstration projects on homeowner properties. 
And so if you will talk to Lauren back there, if, you're, if you have any property on the, um, the waterfront that you would like to have a buffered shoreline put in on, um, we can do it almost for free for you. Um, but you know, a lot of this is about education. It's just making people more aware and changing attitudes about what looks good. You know, grass lawns have, have just been so much in our psyche for so long that it's really hard to change that mindset, but we really need to do it. And so any of you that, are, are, that have the ability um, and don't irrigate, you need to become a role model for your fellow citizens, and so get that written up in a magazine article. I'm serious. I hope if you're local, you'll use Orca as your resource to create a greener and friendlier lawn. But one of our viewers uh, shared a link with me. They said that the waterfrontalliance.org website has some great guidelines on uh, waterfront planting. So if you're not local, you might want to check out waterfrontalliance.org and see if, if those guidelines would help you out with your own yard. So the question is, how are we um, recruiting the young, younger population to be involved? Oh, well, our, our, our citizen science program is really growing by leaps and bounds. There's an awful lot of people that want to do, they want to do something, and they want to do something real. And so I've been very impressed because, uh, you know, we do have a fairly um, stringent training period for our citizen scientists, but they are so dedicated. And you know, when we were doing this study in Queens Cove, it was over December, and it was a huge effort, a huge amount of work. And some of our citizen scientists were showing up late into the evening, you know, working to co um, composite the samples and work them up. And we wouldn't have been able to do it without them. And so it's, it's um, across the age range, but we have very much young people involved. And then we have a program called A Day in the Life um, that uh, in October we have one day when we have thousands of kids up and down the Indian River Lagoon involved in going out and taking science samples. And we have a couple of days of training leading up to that in their classroom and then follow up in their classrooms. So we, we have another Zoom question. Uh, this is about the use of shellfish like oysters and clams to help clean up the estuary. H how does that compare to the external kidney type system that you talked about tonight? So the idea of using oysters and clams um, is, shows up a lot, but I, I think as some of you know, uh, they spent a lot of money to do put oysters in down here in the St. Lucie River, and that doesn't make a lot of sense when we know they're going to do a dump from Lake Okeechobee and kill them all. And so, you know, the oysters are great if, if they're in a place where they can survive. Um, but so often, so many of the things that we need to do always come back to the water quality. We have to get the water quality right before we can get the plant life and the animal life that we need that get, get it even righter. Time, time for maybe one or two more questions. So that's, that was a big issue up in Brevard. Would you mind repeating the question? Uh, where, where are you going to put all the dredged material? And that's always very contentious because it's always not in my backyard. Um, and it's, it's a huge, huge problem. Uh, that's the costliest part of it, is moving the, the dredged material around, dewatering it. Um, so when they dredged Taylor Creek up in Fort Pierce, they um, pumped it up onto the uh, sand ridge. And um, they dug some pits. And I thought they were going to line those pits, but they didn't line the pits. So I'm con con there, one of my concerns is where is the, the outflow going? Because that's right into the aquifer above the sand ridge. So it's a, it's a very valid question. And you need hydrologists that really understand the local systems to work with the people that are going to be impacted by it to figure out what's going to work. But it's not an easy solution. There's no easy solution. 
And I'll finish up with one last question from our online audience. What's the best way to contact ORCA if a private homeowner is interested in taking advantage of that, that project to, to do some plantings around their, their shoreline? If you go to our website, teamorca.org, or there's literature on the back table back there, or as I said, Lauren Tracy in the back um, with ORCA um, would also love to take your name and email address and put you on our mailing list. And thank you all very much for coming. I'm so glad you could be here. Thank you so much, Edie. I, I can't think of a better way to wrap up our series this year than a, a presentation that really brings everything back to home. Folks, all I can say is thank you. We had a wonderful season, and uh, I couldn't do it without you. I hope to see all of you before next year, but if not, I'll see you all again next January. Take care, everybody. Thank you.